Good afternoon. Thank you, Bishop Mansour. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to In Defense of Christians Press and Public Event on ISIS, Genocide, and the International Response. In Defense of Christians, for those of you not familiar with our organization, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to the protection and preservation of Christianity and Christian culture in the Middle East. Today's event at the National Pre Press Club launches a three-day event that we're holding here in Washington, our National Leadership Convention, titled Mobilizing America for Christians in the Middle East. If you're interested in finding out more about the other programs that are taking place this week in our convention, information can be found at www.idcconvention.org. Last month, Pope Francis called the systematic eradication of Christians and other religious minorities from the territories occupied by the self-proclaimed Islamic State as genocide. And in doing so, he invited the international community to do the same. Genocide, as understood under international human rights law, is the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group through killing members of the group, causing bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group calculations to bring about its destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring children to the group of another. Over the last 18 months, the world has watched and witnessed the targeted persecution of minorities under ISIS, suffering violence, displacement, rape, enslavement, and even death. Do these crimes constitute genocide under international law? And if so, what are the options the international community has in order to respond? With us today to discuss this topic, we have a panel of renowned speakers and experts in the field of international law, international human rights law, religious freedom, and human rights public policy. I'd like to begin by, first of all, introducing our panelists um, for today's event. We're honored to have with us, uh, first of all, Mr. Frank Wolf who represented Virginia's 10th Congressional District in the United States from 1981 to January of 2015. He is now a distinguished senior fellow at the 21st Century Wilberforce Initiative. During his long tenure in Congress, Congressman Wolf was known and outstanding for his voice on international human rights issues. We have as well the honor of having with us Dr. Katrina Lanto Sweat, who is the current chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. In 2008, she established the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice and serves as its president and chief executive officer. She also teaches human rights and American foreign policy at Tufts University. We have Mr. Aram Saran Hamparyan who is the executive director of the Armenian National Committee of America and serves as the organization's liaison to the Obama administration, Congress, the media, and the Washington, D.C. foreign policy community. We have as well Dr. Gregory Stanton, who is a research professor in genocide studies and prevention at the George Mason University in Fairfax County, Virginia. He is the founder of and the president of Genocide Watch, and the founder and the director of the Cambodian Genocide Project, and the founder and chair of the International Campaign to End Genocide. As well, we have Professor Robert Destro, who's a professor of law and the founding director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Law and Religion at the Catholic University of America's Columbia School of Law. And myself, my name is Kirsten Evans, and I am uh, with In Defense of Christians and I'll be with you today as well. 
And before I pass the mic, I just want to make sure I didn't do it. I didn't read a typo from our staff notes. It's the Armenian National Committee of America, not Council. Correct? Council, Council and Committee. Okay, so the Armenian National Council of America. I flagged that when I read it. I thought that doesn't sound right. So. Um, with that, I'll explain very briefly how today's event is going to go. We're going to begin with a, a brief presentation by um, Mr. Frank Wolf, who would like to share with us, I'll let him explain the, his, pres his own presentation. He's going to share with us a, a very moving video that he has and offer some words on it. Following his presentation, we'll begin the panel discussion. We have uh, Dr. Lantos Sweat, who will be the uh, moderator for the discussion. We'll hear from all of the panelists and will be followed by a guided discussion among the panelists and as well Q&A from the audience. So thank you very much. Congressman Wolf. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank you for the work that you do and you have a great panel. You're going to learn a lot. They're really a group of very outstanding and distinguished individuals. The Bible has much to say about the persecution and oppression and ultimately freedom. And Jesus, in reading from Isaiah at the synagogue in Nazareth, said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed. And we all know the words of Ecclesiastes 4, 1. Again, I looked, I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors. What we now see in uh, Iraq and Syria is genocide. It meets the official Raphael Lemkin definition. It is genocide. It is genocide of the Christians and the Yazidis and probably the Turkmen and maybe one or two other religious minorities. I visited Iraq in January of this year with the group that I'm with, the 21st Century Wilberforce Group. We didn't have the embassy. We didn't talk to our State Department people. Right now, to get in Iraq, you got to be in at a certain hour and out by dark, and you can't even really know what's going on. So we spent five days going through villages, went up to the front lines. Pershmerga took us out and talked to and interviewed roughly 75 uh, five people. When I came back, I wondered, does this administration care? Does the Congress care? Does the UN care? And sometimes, does the church care? More biblical activity took place in Iraq than any other country of the world other than Israel. Abraham, my first trip there, we went to Nasiriyah, and our troops said, this is Ur, and it took us to the site of Abraham's village. Isaac's bride, Rebecca, is from there. Jacob spent 20 years in Iraq. The 12 tribes of Israel were all born in Iraq. The book of Jonah and Nineveh, they blew up Jonah's tomb five months ago. Daniel was buried in Iraq. Ezekiel was buried in Iraq. And St. Thomas conveyed Christianity to Iraq, and the nuns we were with all spoke Aramaic, the same language as Jesus. A phrase not often heard, certainly not in the United States, but it was said to me out there, and when I've been through the region and in Egypt and other places, is a phrase not heard is first the Saudi people and then the Sunni people. The Jewish community in Iraq in 1950 was 150,000. When we were there in January, I asked, and they said, officially, we think there are 10 individuals left. And then one person said, maybe four elderly individuals left. In 2003, there were one and a half million Christians in Iraq. Now the number is 300,000. Many of you might know better. Some say it could even be as low as 250,000. And we heard from Bishop Word of the other day when he was in town, who also, God bless him, called a genocide. There's something like 17 families leave every day. As we just said to you, the Pope, and I'm very grateful, the Pope in South America and Brazil, I believe, called this genocide. Cardinal Dolan called it genocide. Cardinal Whirl has spoken out about it. Russell Moore has spoken out about it. Rick Warren has spoken out about it. A number, but not enough have really spoken out about it. I am hopeful, I am hopeful that the Pope will, when he's on, before a joint session of the Congress, with all the House and the Senate and the Joint Chiefs and the Cabinet and the world watching, that the Pope will call it genocide. And that in itself can be a game, game changer. Everyone running for the House 
for the Senate, for the presidents, they ought to be able to articulate what their position is and what they would do with regard to the genocide that's taking place in Iraq and also in Syria. And let's not forget the Coptic Christians, the 21 Coptic Christians who were beheaded. And the word out of the administration was just 21 Egyptians. They were 21 Coptic Christians. And you saw the way that they responded. I today sent a letter, and it's out there, to the Attorney General of the United States, asking them to do two, two things. One, to begin the process to gather the information to call this genocide. Secondly, to indict and convict al-Baghdadi and Jihadi John. They were responsible for the death of four Americans. If this administration could convict or prosecute or bring a charge to the head of the World Soccer Organization, cannot not bring a charge against Baghdadi and Jihadi John. They killed American citizens, four American citizens. And the letter there lays out com completely why, I think, and what the ground rules were and what the authority is and why they should, should, should do it. If the administration fails to seek end justice for these crimes, it's failing to comply with the mandates that it itself has said. The president stood in front of the Holocaust Memorial in 2012 and declared never again at five times. We failed the Armenians in the Armenian genocide. We failed them. To have called that genocide would have only honored those who have been killed. Nothing more was to gain, but we failed. We failed in Srebrenica. You remember Jenna Delare in Rwanda that said genocide is coming and we failed. Will we fail in the Middle East? I'm going to show you a film and then I'm going to end with one comment. Could we show the film now? resist an evil door but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek turn the other also loving your enemy this is a far better way this is how we were called to live to understand this unnatural virtue we must look to Jesus Christ as our model and our guide strength. 
his silence, his statement to the world. We must pray for those who persecute us. Prayer is the mechanism that reaches heaven and moves mankind. Prayer. It's easy to underestimate prayer. But, but this quiet action
whistle in my sleep. I can still hear him crying out for help. God forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians yet did nothing to intervene. when I tell you that the reality was indescribably worse than these pictures. You cannot photograph suffering, only its results. the last 24 hours, more than a quarter of a million people have fled Rwanda and its terror. Lines at some border crossings stretch for five miles. There is a sign at Dachau in five different languages that says never again. We in the West are singing a little louder. And I end with two quotes. Dr. Martin Luther King said that in the end, we will remember the words, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but we will remember the silence of our friends. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who as you recall, stood up against the Nazis, was actually out of Germany and came back, was hung in Flossenburg State Prison, and they said when he was hung, you could actually hear the Western artillery coming in, said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. The question is, will we, the church and the West, will we speak and will we act? Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Um, it's difficult to follow uh, a movie like that. And as many of you know, I myself am the daughter of um, Holocaust survivors. So forgive me if I am a little overcome at the beginning of my remarks because the indifference and the willful inability to hear and the singing louder to cover up the awareness of the atrocity and the horror going on um, is something that my own family experienced and endured. But I want to thank Congressman Wolf for bringing that movie to us today, for reminding us that the evil of the past is now present again amongst us and shame on us, and we dare not uh, sing louder and close our ears. And I don't know whether the congressman is still here, but I do need to say one thing about him, because when I knew I would be appearing uh, with Congressman Wolf today, a scripture came to my mind that I think very much embodies um, his extraordinary example of never, ever being silent, and it's one that perhaps is familiar to some of you, Isaiah 62, 1, where the prophet writes, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. So Congressman Wolf, thank you for never holding your peace and never being silent. I will try to deliver the rest of my remarks. Um, my parents and I became human rights defenders precisely to ensure that nothing like the Holocaust would ever happen again. Well, as we all know, what the world promised would never happen again 
is happening today. Mass murder, mass rape, mass torture, mass enslavement, all of this is happening through ISIL and like-minded groups, even as I speak. In Iraq and Syria alone, women and girls have been kidnapped and enslaved, men and boys beheaded or crucified, families driven from their homes facing starvation and death, and 2,000-year-old communities of life and faith uprooted and threatened with extinction. And no religious group has been free of ISIL's depredations in the areas it has conquered. Indeed, ISIL has unleashed waves of terror upon Yazidis and Christians, Shia and Sunni Muslims, anyone who dares oppose its views. It often has been said that ISIL and like-minded groups and their leaders seek to recover a mythical golden age of Islam from a far distant past. While they might believe this to be the case, we must also realize that they are propelled by an inescapably modern and terrifying idea. Surfacing in the last century, that idea came to be known as totalitarianism. The characteristics of this malignant idea are chillingly obvious to every one of us in this room. Fanatical leaders and movements are given absolute and permanent authority. These leaders and by extension their followers become virtual gods charged with seizing control of history and transforming humanity itself. Both leaders and followers are released from accountability to any law or institution, belief or custom, and moral norm or precept. And these leaders and their followers assume complete control over every facet of human existence, from outward conduct to the innermost workings of conscience. For the better part of a century, those promoting and exploiting totalitarianism have advanced it by dressing it up in a variety of costumes and hijacking various ideals and institutions, putting them to work in its cause. In the 1930s and 40s, they threatened humanity through what my parents endured during that dark era, Nazism and other forms of fascism, which exploited the ideology of nationalism. After World War II, totalitarianism posed its greatest threat through various forms of communism, which exploited the concepts of class and class consciousness and hijacked people's strivings for social justice. By the close of the 20th century, Adherents of these movements had committed every crime under the sun, triggering the deaths of more than 100 million human beings. They also waged war against the rights of conscience, leaving behind a world where, to this day, most people live in countries that are hostile to freedom of religion or belief. And today, proponents of that same totalitarian impulse, which drove Nazism and communism, have hijacked religion as its latest vehicle, creating various forms of violent religious extremism. Displaying utter contempt for the rule of law and for any distinction between combatants and non-combatants in the conduct of war, they commit mass torture and murder precisely as the Nazis and communists did. Many observers pre presume that these movements and their leaders simply represent religion on steroids. The butchers of ISIS claim that they represent true religion, but nothing could be further from the truth. To be sure, the history of nearly every religion contains periods of despotism and bloodshed, but let us be clear. No religion ever stood in principle as the Nazis and communists did, and as the proponents of ISILs and others do today, for what amounts to sheer unadulterated nihilism. The idea that any and every means, torture and rape, prostitution and drug sales, the slaughter of innocent children and defenseless elderly people may be carried out in service to a cause. No religion ever granted any human being, group or government the right permanently in principle to flout any rule, break any law or commit any atrocity at will. In other words, the struggle we face is not that of one religion against another, nor of religion against humanity. Rather, it is a struggle that pits lawless brutality and tyranny against decency, dignity, and freedom. So what can we do about it? How do we stop ISIL and others from continuing to inflict horrors on humanity? 
There is much that must be done through military, diplomatic, humanitarian, and economic means. But I would like to speak to the matter specifically from a human rights and religious freedom perspective. You serve the organization of which I'm part, and I should mention I'm not any longer chair. I am proud to have passed on that torch to our current chair, the distinguished professor, Dr. Robert George. Um, USERF continues to recommend that the United States support a referral to the, by the UN Security Council to the ICC to investigate ISIL abuses in Iraq and Syria against religious and ethnic minorities. In addition, the United States should ensure that the efforts of the global coalition to counter ISIL include steps to protect and assist the region's most vulnerable religious and ethnic minorities, and where appropriate, assist Iraqi government and KRG security forces in efforts to protect likely targets of sectarian or religiously motivated violence. But ultimately, ISIL and like-minded groups must be defeated in the realm of ideas. Simply stated, the way to defeat its terrorism is not just to stop its terrorists physically, but to cut off its supply of terrorists by dissuading people from choosing its ideology of terrorism in the first place. How do we do this? How do we counter violent religious extremism by ISIL or any other group in the world? We do it through ideas and beliefs which are neither violent nor extremist. How do we combat expressions of faith that dishonor some people? We affirm those which honor all people. But there is only one way for this to happen. We must stand unabashedly for the universal fundamental human right of religious freedom. We must stand tall for the principle that all people have the right to think as they please, believe or not believe as their conscience leads, and live out their beliefs openly, peacefully, and without fear or intimidation. We must stand firmly for the notion that the way to defeat bad pseudo-religious ideas isn't with no religious ideas, but with competing ideas, both religious and non-religious, operating in a free and vibrant marketplace of ideas. Study after study shows how it is the absence of religious freedom which correlates with violent religious extremism and other ills, and it is the presence of religious freedom which correlates with more stability, more security, and more harmony. I know I am very much over time, and so I'm going to skip to the end of my remarks and hopefully cover some of what I'll have to skip in, in our uh, moderated discussion. But in conclusion, I would like to urge each and every one of you to stay involved and not lose hope in these dark days of ISIL. Silence is no option, nor was it ever an option for men and women of conscience. So let us stand together. Let us break bread together. Let us shine the brightest of lights on this darkness together. Let us never give up. Let us never give in until the darkness disperses and freedom and dignity prevail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lantos Sweat. Um, following Katrina's very moving and very convincing remarks, we're gonna hear from the members of the panel who are all gonna give some brief statements and then open up to um, a general group discussion and Q&A. So, um, Professor Destro, would you uh, do us the honor of beginning? Sure. You know, it, it falls to me as, as, one of the, as the lawyer on the panel to, uh, to kind of warn you what you're going to be hearing over the next few months as we get into a big discussion of this topic. And so what I want to do at the very beginning is ask you to draw a, a line in your head to differentiate between genocide as a crime, like murder, you know, and genocide as a concept or as a behavior. Because what Congress may say and what the people, what, what Mr. Wolf has just said, you know, is they're talking about the behavior. You know, and, and what we need to do is we need to bring ourselves together to talk about the crimes. And so you know, there's a danger here. You know, when you talk about the um, when you talk about the human rights of the victims, that's very important. 
you know, but from the lawyer's perspective, I want to know about the perpetrators. You know, we know what happened to the victims. The question is, what are we going to do to the perpetrators? And so what we need is, and this is one of the reasons why our government gets paralyzed, because it assumes that it has to operationalize a response militarily. Well, yeah, that's a part of it. You know, but in order to, to do an effective military prevention of genocide, you have to surround the people who are the targets and make sure the bad guys don't get them. That's the first step. The second step is to identify who is funding and who is, we know the names of some of the, the kingpins, you know, but we need to know where that money's coming from. And as you hear the discussion over the next few days and the next week or so about Iran, you know, and about people telling you that sanctions were working, well, that's debatable. But what is not debatable is that sa banking sanctions, where you went after and you traced their money, were working. So much so that one of the major banks in the Far East sent back $20 billion to the, to the central bank of its country for fear that the treasury would say something to them. And so if we want to put the fear of God you know, and the fear of international criminal tribunals into people, there's ways to do that, but it's not with militaries. It's using the, using the things we used effectively against Iran to bring these people to justice. Third point. You need a court. Okay, now in Syria, there aren't really any functioning courts. You know, but the Arab countries, which consider this to be partly their issue, have been talking for years about an Arab court of human rights. Let's get it set up and let's get it moving. You know, so that basically we have to have a legal strategy, a, a public relations strategy, of which this press conference is one. You know, and everybody's got to call things by their proper name. Now, let me just, I'm going to read two brief things. One is a, it's a book, it's called Understanding the Turkish-Armenian Controversy Over 1915. It's written by a Turk. The bottom line is nobody was ever convicted, so you can't call it genocide. You know, and, and, you know, and he says, look, I admit that there were atrocities. Well, good. The, the first step in admitting that you, that you have a problem is that you admit it. Okay, the question is, I don't want to see us 10 years from now saying that we don't have any convictions. Okay, but the more telling comment was written by Samantha Power in her excellent book, A Problem from Hell, American in the Age of Genocide. And she says, and I quote, before I begin exploring America's relationship with genocide, I used to refer to U.S. policy toward Bosnia as a failure. I have changed my mind. It is daunting to acknowledge, but this country's consistent policy of non-intervention in the face of genocide offers sad testimony not to a broken American political system, but one that is ruthlessly effective. The system as it stands now is working. No U.S. president has ever made genocide prevention a priority, and no U.S. president have, has, has ever suffered politically for his indifference to its occurrence. It's thus no coincidence that genocide rages on. So in other words, the people in Iran are kind of, or the people in Iraq, the people in Syria, they're just collateral damage to the fights of the big powers to move people around on the chessboard. And so what we really need is, we, you know, I really thank IDC for putting this together. I thank all of you for coming. But believe me, we just have to stand up and scream that our government get a policy in the Middle East, which it doesn't have now. And, and if we put the Christians, the Shia, the Yazidis, all the different groups, and it's not just the Middle East. Remember Boko Haram. You know, and the, the, the carnage in Myanmar. You know, we got to get everybody into this, and we got to call things by their proper name, and genocide's a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Destro. Thank you to all um, 
the folks I'm honored to join today. Uh, Congressman Wolf is uh, a hero to the entire human rights community and, and certainly to the, the Armenian community as well. Uh, Professor Stanton is a, is a teacher to a generation of genocide prevention uh, advocates. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Katrina uh, Sweat, uh, Katrina Lanto Sweat is a, is a hero to us and also a great leader in uh, the, the Commission for International Religious Freedom, which, uh, do not forget, is a, like a, the creation of which was a milestone in U.S. Uh, human rights policy, U.S. religious uh, freedom policy. Really, um, um, an epic um, moment in uh, sort of America's journey toward, uh, I think, a, a more uh, moral policy on these types of issues. So thank you for your leadership uh, on that. Um, and thank you especially to, to In Defense of Christians. Uh, I need to first give uh, credit to where uh, it is uh, due, uh, to folks like Minar and folks like Tufik and folks like, folks like uh, Kirsten who've done heroic work. But the success of In Defense of Christians, I think, first and foremost speaks to uh, the fact that you're uh, addressing and amplifying and uh, um, elevating issues that really matter to Americans, right? This is not like, um, this is nothing other than what we believe as Americans. People should be uh, free to live their lives. People should be free to practice their faith. People should be uh, safe from uh, persecution and intolerance and genocide. I think the success of the organization is, like I said, uh, the result of a lot of work, but also the fact that the, the values are very much American values. And I think that's why we've seen such success uh, over the past uh, year and, and more. Um, as an Armenian, it means a lot to be here. Um, my own family uh, fled the Armenian genocide, uh, found safe haven in Syria, ultimately uh, in Lebanon, and then uh, uh, the family made its way to the United States. So in a sense, as Armenians, we're experiencing this for a second time. And I think um, those who have seen this type of persecution with their own eyes, in a sense, they're through their nation's eyes, uh, bear a special responsibility to help prevent that type of evil from being visited upon others. I think uh, certainly the, the, the Jewish American community has played a, a powerful leadership role in this regard. I think the Armenians uh, have worked very hard in this regard as well. All those who've experienced this, right? Uh, when we read the stories, when we see the video, when we watch the photos of what's happening today in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere, it reminds us in the most uh, profound ways of the experiences of our own families. Uh, we need to, to fight that, and I think, um, I think, you know, if, if we, when we ask ourselves, well, what is the answer? What is the answer? And it can get really complicated. You get into the military side and the political side and the diplomatic side. I think at its very, very core, right, the American response and the world response to genocide, right, must be a moral one. It is a moral imperative. Sadly, sadly, the reality of the world's response and our, our own government's response, and it makes me very sad to say that as an American, has been to treat genocide and our response to genocide as a political commodity. Look at how we treat today uh, the leader of Sudan, right? Omar al-Bashir is, um, we do business with him because it's the stuff of politics that we need to do business with him. Uh, let us see, how, how do we treat uh, the Republic of Turkey and its denial of the Armenian genocide? Well, we do business with them because we need to do business with them. I would say, and I would argue, that if we can, and this is a, is a long process, it's the work of generations, right? But if we can elevate the response of our nation, right, to genocide from a political choice to a moral imperative, then all the pieces will fall into place, right? But right now, the perpetrators of genocide know that if they commit these crimes and they have the sufficient political will and sufficient political power, they can... Um, they can, they can uh, get the world to back off, to not intervene, and ultimately to, to buy into their, the lies. Because I guarantee you, the crimes that are being committed today will be denied tomorrow. They will be denied tomorrow. And if they, if they have sufficient uh, power, the deniers of those crimes will get away with it. And they, the, 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 the atrocities against Yezdis and Christians and others will be written out of the history books because it's inconvenient to remember them. So I, I, I had a... I'll close with a thought, right? Um... um I think it was Cain, right, who asked, am I my brother's keeper, right? And certainly the, the answer to that question is, is it's, a, it's a moral question, right? And it's a theological question. Uh, but let us not think that it's also not a political question, right? It is a false choice to think that the suffering of others uh, will never infl impact me, right? It is a, a false choice to say, well, we cannot take this moral stand because there's a ma material cost. Does anyone really think that America is gonna prosper by remaining silent in the face of genocide? Does anyone think that the world will be a safer place by virtue of our silence in the face of genocide? Those are absolutely false choices. Genocide needs a powerful response, needs a moral response. When we as a society, when we as a state, when we as a government and an international community respond to genocide morally, right, then we will find the will, 
right? Take the concrete steps to prevent that genocide and uh, to punish that genocide. As long as we treat genocide as a political commodity, we'll fall short again and again, and we'll see uh, the type of suffering that we see today uh, again and again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Stanton, can I invite you to uh, give a statement? We are in a spiritual war. This is not just an ordinary war. It is not just an ordinary conflict. ISIS represents the demonic interpretation of Islam taken to its ultimate extreme. And the only way that ISIS can be defeated is through spiritual force. And that is why it is so important for Christians to unite, for Jews to unite, for people of other faiths, and for, for true Muslims to unite against ISIS. ISIS is like communism. That is why it is so attractive to young people, because it promises a utopia that is somehow from the past. What it reminds me of, having worked on the Cambodian Tribunal, having written its rules, is the Khmer Rouge, who also wanted to create a utopia that was based on the 11th century. And what they did was murder a quarter of their population. Well, ISIS is in the process of doing that right now in Syria and Iraq. And if we do not stop them, they will succeed. And they will succeed fast. That is why we have to act fast. There are two things we have to do immediately. First of all, we have to galvanize NATO to take resolute action to really stop ISIS in every way, diplomatically, militarily, and in every other possible way. And we have to stop it through force. I'm sorry to say it, but I believe this, this satisfies every one of Thomas Aquinas' definitions of a just war. That does not mean I'm in favor of war in general. It does not mean I'm, you know, uh, because I'm a great follower of Martin Luther King III and Martin Luther King Jr. in believing that, in fact, if you can use nonviolent resistance, it's the best way to go about fighting a force that is evil. But I know this, that ISIS cannot be defeated this way. The second thing that we have to do is we have to somehow undermine their ideology. And that is why Professor Destro's suggestion that these people should be put on trial is so important. This is one of the few cases where you could actually get, I believe, a referral by the UN Security Council of ISIS to the International Criminal Court because Russia and China are just as afraid of ISIS as we are. At the very least, I think we'd get them to abstain in the UN Security Council, just as they abstained, and so did we, by the way, on the refer uh, referral of Sudan to the International Criminal Court. I think that should be done immediately, and it will mean that there will be an investigation underway immediately. And right now, the prosecutor has said she doesn't have jurisdiction. Well, she soon will, if it is referred by the UN Security Council, as you know. I think he's also right that we should, in the long run, also create a Middle Eastern Court of Human Rights and Middle Eastern Criminal Court. And of course, we should use our national courts, which are already there. I think that uh, the congressman already suggested that because, he's, because these people have murdered at least four Americans, they'd actually be <laughs> triable here in the, in the U, uh, U.S. courts if we could capture them. So those are legal ways to undermine their ideology. But I think we also have to face the fact that we as a people need to use the G word. This, folks, is genocide. I am the head of Genocide Watch. We have actually done 
empirical studies of the difference between calling something genocide and calling it something, something else, ethnic cleansing or crimes against humanity <coughs> and so forth. The results of those empirical studies are that you get four times as much chance of forceful action to stop it if you call it with the G word, if you call it genocide. Genocide is a powerful word, and we should be using it. Now, I'm here to present to you a appeal by genocide scholars around the world to the United States Congress, signed by, well, I think there are at least uh, half of the members of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. These are the greatest scholars in the world on this subject, appealing to the U.S. Congress to call it genocide. We can defeat this. You know why I know that? Because I was also part of the movement to bring down the Soviet Union. And I'll never forget when I was a legal advisor to the Ukrainian independence movement, when this little babushka, about four feet tall, down in, a, in one of the Orthodox churches there, pulled me down to her level, about down here, and she says, we will win. And I didn't understand at the first. And then she said, again, she said, we will win because it is God's work. Thank you very much, Dr. Stanton. Thank you very much. I um, have as well here written remarks that I was asked to deliver to you by one of our panelists who unfortunately at the very last moment had to withdraw from the panel. He's actually, I don't actually think he's on a plane right now, I think he's probably already landed, but he was um, called out to the region um, on his way out to Iraq in order to deal with some humanitarian aid projects that he was, he's involved in. And uh, unfortunately was unable to be at the panel today but sent his words and that is, uh, Johnny Moore, and I apologize for not having introduced him in the lineup, but he wasn't here, so I didn't introduce him. Um, Johnny Moore, for many of you know, is a best-selling author and a humanitarian who uh, recently published the book Defying ISIS. In 2014, he witnessed the current Middle East refugee crisis firsthand, met with the King of Jordan, Orthodox patriarchs, Catholic cardinals, and the UN, and the world's largest NGOs members of the Iraqi government and hundreds of refugees to address this issue. He did send along um, some remarks and I told him that we would uh, make his remarks known. So I might amend them slightly just in the interest of time, but I'll try to do them justice. On behalf of Johnny Moore, I've anticipated this gathering and this press conference for many months. Yet at the very last moment, I was called to Europe for an emergency international meeting on the refugee crisis and humanitarian aid, especially as it affects Christians who are already on the move or who intend on leaving their ancestral homes. It's a terribly difficult decision for me, but I've always had a bias towards putting my feet on the ground and getting dirt under my fingernails. I will be going back to the region immediately to work, and I feel we don't have a single second to spare. So with this statement, I will have to suffice for my remarks today. Thank you very much for hearing them. Number one, the United States and the United Nations must deem the ISIS assault on Christians and Yazidis as genocide. We must do all in our power to force them to do so. As my distinguished co-panelist here today, Congressman Frank Wolf has more than articulated the case for declaring this as a genocide. And many of our other panelists have as well, in particular, Dr. Stanton. This is precisely why the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Gen Genocide was created. This must happen now. Number two, it is non-discriminatory to issue visas disproportionately to victims of genocide. The U.S. government must immediately provide opportunities for Iraq and Syrian Christians to immigrate to the United States. Number three, the Syrian and Iraqi refugee crisis is a full-on emergency and it's an emergency caused by the international community. In the words of Johnny Moore, not in the least of which includes the United States, and it persists in exaggerated form because of our inaction, indifference, and sense of denial. We have a moral obligation to fix the problem that we have partially created. Number four, we must work on sustaining those who aim to stay and evacuate 
to him to stay and evacuate those who decide to leave. I refuse to embrace the false dilemma between sustaining those who choose to stay in their homelands and allowing those who aim to leave the opportunity to leave to give them an opportunity to safely and legally immigrate to a new country. Our job as humanitarians is to provide support to those in needs, to those in need, and both of these options should be an option of support. And number five, the threat of ISIS and other extremism remains underestimated by the United States. We continue not to take the threat seriously. Five years ago, there was one failed nation in the world, Somalia. Now we have Syria, Yemen, and Libya as failed, failed nation states, and Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan are teetering on chaos. We've also nearly lost the northeastern of Nigeria, the northeast of Kenya, and much of the Sinai Peninsula, while ISIS sympathizers are active in at least 30 countries. Despite all this, and despite the lone wolf attacks and threats against Western countries, and despite the ability of ISIS to replenish its foreign fighters and wage its guerrilla war in so many countries, despite the children who have been made slaves, the fathers who have been executed, the women who have been trafficked, and the churches and temples that have been destroyed, the West continues to pay little attention, and the attention we pay is not enough, and it is too late. So on, that's on, behalf, of, uh, on behalf of Johnny Moore, who was unable to be here today. These are now my own and not Johnny Moore's. And I'm going to amend them slightly as well in the interest of time in order to hand the microphone back to uh, Dr. Lantos Sweat in order to guide the discussion. Um, I think on, I, many of the things that have been said here on this panel are, of course, things that myself and in the name of In Defense of Christians we wanted to say as well. And I think that there's there's some there's strength in the fact that there's unity of perspective, right? There's strength in the fact that there is an echo of um, uh, not only of of concern but of vision and and a voice on what needs to take place on this issue. Uh, one of the things I would like to add to the conversation is simply uh, a couple of thoughts, and the first being this: I don't think that the international community has the luxury at this state of uh, waiting for international organizations and um, international governments and governments of nations to take action on this issue. I think that we, the communities, we citizens, we members of humanity, we need to be the people who are taking action on this issue. We need to lead on this issue and governments and international organizations will follow. We don't have the luxury to wait for them to take the leadership. We have to lead and they will have to follow. So what are some of the ways, if we're discussing the options that the international community has in addressing this crisis, what are some of the, the options that are to, to those of us that don't sit in, in the halls of power or make uh, far-reaching policy decisions for um, nations or, or international alliances? Well, first of all, I think one of the things that we need to do as a community is that we need to continue to organize a unified, a strong, and a solid voice of uh, ecumenical concern and political uh, advocacy on this issue. The world needs to hear a voice, a unified voice on this issue. And that voice is going to need to come from a tapestry of a lot of different communities and uh, a, a lot of different corners of the world, but the voice itself needs to be orchestrated so that it's sound and that it's vibrant and that it's solid and that it's heard. The other thing I think that we need to do is that we continue to need to raise awareness within our own communities about um, the nature of the situation of Christians in the Middle East in general and the nature of the situation of Christians in Middle East under the current situation of ISIS in particular. That outreach is paramount. It's paramount within our own communities, within our own church communities, within our own university communities, our academic communities, uh, our, our local communities. It's paramount to be done through media and through uh, uh, broad communication techniques in order to get awareness and knowledge to, um, to the general American public and to the general international public at large. What are some of the things that we can be asking for? 
as we coordinate this, this orchestrated voice. A lot of things I think have already been mentioned here today. The question of military intervention is one that nations and national governments and leaders are going to have to weigh and weigh heavily. Right? But beyond, and certainly without a doubt, there's, uh, there's precedence and uh, there can be arguments right, and on both sides for, for that type of intervention. But aside from inter uh, military intervention, there's a lot of things as an international community that we can be asking for, we, we can be asking for from our leaders and international political leaders. Not the least of which is um, for the international community to take seriously the consideration of a protected zone for Christians and other minorities in the Nineveh Plain province in order to offer um, members of the region a safe haven and a safe zone in which um, they can find safety in a time of persecution. Congressman Fortenberry and Congressman Eshu, who are the co-chairs of the Congressional Caucus on International Religious Freedom, or excuse me, the Congressional Caucus on Religious Minorities in the Middle East, recently wrote a president to national to wrote a letter to President Obama, and one of the things that they asked for was for the United States to um, consider giving more military support, either in training or in, in funding, um, to the National Guard and to uh, the, um, particularly the Nineveh Project Unit and the National Guard and to other National Guard militaries on the ground who are willing and able and competent to defend their own communities. The United States has in 2015 authorized $1.6 billion to train and support local Iraqi forces. If, if, if those Iraqi forces are, um, if some of that money can be helped to um, support as well other units that are willing to work in conjunction with the Iraqi forces, that's something that could be considered or talked about. Right? Um, similarly, as an as international community, I think we can continue to push our governments to open up prioritized uh, assistance for refugees and displaced persons, um, to allow for an expedited refugee process for, for religious minorities or people who feel that they are in danger of, of persecution for uh, religi religious or ethnic reasons. We need to be pushing our governments for humanitarian aid that is emboldened, that's coordinated, that guarantees delivery for displaced communities. Working with the international community for the preservation of culture through international organizations and churches in order to preserve Christian culture in the region guarantee the return of property to the rightful owners of communities when conflict is finally able to be settled, God willing, in the near future. And look at ways in which we can invest in education on an international level in, or, in order to fight radicalization and to promote religious tolerance. In short, we as members of the American community need to be elevating, need to be asking our policymakers to elevate religious freedom, freedom of conscience, in the United States international policy making and to make the promotion of religious freedom and pluralism a priority of US foreign policy that's communicated to the world. So thank you very much. With that, I will leave uh, the microphone to Dr. Lantos Sweat. Um, what a privilege for me to be part of such an exceptional, extraordinary panel and um, I can already tell we're going to run out of time but I, I, uh, because there's so much to discuss. But I want to start out um, with the quote that you um, offered, Professor Destro, to the effect from Samantha Power, to the effect that no president ever paid a price for exhibiting indifference um, to genocide unfolding on their watch. We don't need to look back very far. During the Clinton administration, they went through extraordinary verbal gymnastics to avoid uttering the word genocide in connection with what was unmistakably and clearly a genocide unfolding on our TV screens every night and and it was it was appalling and intolerable. The question I'd like to, to ask the panelists to discuss is how can um, the community, the engaged and concerned community during this um, window of opportunity that a presidential campaign offers go about holding every single person running for president accountable to answer the questions um, that, that I believe uh, you pose, Professor, that where do they stand? Are they ready to call this a genocide? What would their policy be? So I'd kind of like to, to throw that question open for starters to the panel. Uh, 
I'd get somebody to ask them at every single town meeting that they have, is this genocide? And what will they do about it? Simple. I'll go, I'll go a step further. Whoever is the first candidate who goes over there and actually talks to people, that's the one I'll take seriously. I mean, because look, it's not what they say, it's what they do. You know, so it's like, it's like my father used to say, put your money where your mouth is. And so, and, and this is, you know, what we're gonna find, I think, unfortunately, is as you, as you follow the money trail, it's gonna lead into the front rooms of our friends, the Saudis, the Qataris. It's gonna lead into the Revolutionary Guard. It's gonna lead to a lot of really inconvenient places. You know, so. That's true. You know, and it's gonna force, especially the Republicans, to get serious about who our friends are and who our enemies are. Um, I could offer a couple thoughts. Yes, please. I, th I think um, affecting change in this area uh, is very difficult. There is no more insulated aspect of U.S. governance than foreign policy. Uh, healthcare, taxes, uh, environmental issues, uh, the, the role of citizens is very robust. Uh, start talking about diplomacy and, and the U.S. diplomatic community, which has a kind of an aristocratic heritage, as all diplomacy does, uh, tends to view this as, a, as their special province. So the, the role of citizens in, in shaping the diplomacy of the United States or any country, frankly, has never been really robust. But that's, that's something that needs to change. It's an area where um, sort of our uh, democratic voice as Americans need to, needs to grow stronger, uh, number one. Number two, uh, we need to have a very uh, sort of a cold-blooded understanding of the difference between campaigning and governance, okay? Look at, look at the most recent example we have of a human rights issue that reached the level of a national political campaign. We can look at 2008 uh, and, and the Darfur issue. Um, both uh, Senators McCain and Senator Obama um, were pressured on the issue. The issue became a campaign issue. They both issued a joint statement. I, I recall uh, quoting the, the statement that they would uh, demonstrate unstinting resolve to, uh, uh, to stop the genocide uh, in Darfur and to, to protect the citizens of Sudan. I don't think any of us can say that, that President Obama, who won that race, demonstrated unstinting uh, resolve. Um, those are the negatives, right? You have a very insulated foreign policy system that resists uh, public pressure. Uh, and you have this notion that you can get a lot of stuff during campaign, but only some small percentage of that actually gets reflected in policy uh, going forward. Um, the good news is, right, that the change that we want is consistent with the values of the American people. This is a very, very important point. The change that we want is consistent with the values of the American people. You take a poll of the American people, of those who follow these issues, and they'll be on the right side of the issue. You take a poll uh, among my friends at the Department of State, or the CIA, or the Department of Defense, right, you're gonna get a position paper. It's not gonna be about the right thing to do. It's gonna be about, well, here are the interests, here are the pipelines, here are the military bases, and it's gonna end up being like, guess what? Business as usual. Business as usual. The trick is, though, in every election, you just move the ball down the field a little bit further. You move it down the field a little, a little further every time, and it's going to be good for America, right? Because we're going to get to the point. We're going to get to the point where genocide and the response to genocide is a moral imperative. But we got to, got to, sort of, uh, sort of push every election. Never go into the election thinking like, this is going to be an election where we'll do the right thing. I don't, I, I, we haven't had an election like that, frankly, yet. Uh, but but you, you do make progress during elections. And I think on Darfur, we did make some progress, not, not sufficient. This time around on, on ISIS, we should push further and, and, and hold their feet to the fire even more so that they should know that Americans vote on these issues. So these are some thoughts. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I would second what everyone said, and I think I would just add to that as well. Um, I think you know what moves what moves politicians are numbers, right? What moves politicians are, and so I think if we can um, reflect to them um, the again a, a voice of of unity that goes across communities and across cultures and uh, across um, you know s smaller communities within their constituents. And, and reflect uh, a, a unified voice and a, a unified petition, a unified ask, I think that they, that they will respond and that they will hear. Um, and I think it's up to the American people to demand that it be a question on, you know, on every, any, any viable presidential candidate needs to know that he or she's gonna have to be prepared to answer and to answer um, intelligently and in detail on this question because the American people are gonna demand it from them. So, mm -hmm. 
And in that regard, I would invite all of you to come up to New Hampshire, <laughs> which happens to be where I'm from, because in New Hampshire, you really do have access with the cameras, the TV cameras rolling to the individual candidates. And I would encourage this community every time there's going to be a national debate, a CNN or a Fox debate, and they have an opportunity for people to email in questions, make sure that questions on this topic are flooded in so that they will um, surface and they will be asked of the candidates. Um, but I want to pivot off of something you said a moment ago and, and in your remarks to about a unified um, voice and, and sort of bringing people across the spectrum together on this issue. To what extent do the panelists feel that perhaps the community represented here that cares very, very passionately about the genocide that's going on, about the mortal threat to these ancient Christian communities and to other religious minority communities in the Middle East, need to, well, first need to go to school on the lessons of the Soviet Jewry movement, the movement to free Soviet Jewry, the movement to fight against apartheid in South Africa. And, and this may be uncomfortable for some people in this room, the movement by um, the gay and lesbian community in the United States to make their issues and their concern something that went in a relatively short period of time from the fringes of society to a very central concern. I think that there are are lessons to be learned. I, I want to hear what the panelists have to say, but I guess the question I would pose to you is, how do you think those who have uppermost as, as a burning mission in their lives to, to, to stop this terrible persecution and genocide of these ancient Christian communities can make common cause with those who are now perhaps politically ascendant domestically in this country, do not have a natural inclination to build a bridge there, but nonetheless have a commitment to fundamental human rights and could be appealed to um, to, to come on board. So let me throw that, that slightly um, provocative question perhaps out to, to this group. Anybody brave enough to jump in first? <laughs> I'll jump in first. Uh, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think that I think the first community we have to have uh, in, in, on our side, though, is the American Muslim community. I mean, because it's, there's, it's a very, there's a very sensitive understanding because you know, they don't like the idea of talking just about Christians. Because when you look at the numbers as opposed to the proportion, more Muslims die. You know, and, and there has been resistance in the Muslim community in the Middle East, you know, to, to bringing Shia within the ambit of people who are being protected. So, you know, this is, this has rightly been described as a fight for the soul of Islam. And I think you were right, Dr. Stanton, about that. You know, so the question is, you know, if this is, if we're going to talk about politics, it's the, it's the, the art of addition. And so we need to kind of figure out who we need to have, and then we need to bring them in. And so, you know, I don't care is if they're people of good faith, you know, you know, if, 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 if the LGBT community is there, fine, but there's two. Let's understand there's two, tr there is tension between the LGBT community and the traditional Christian community. You know, so I mean, we need to, we can't paper that over, but the fact of the matter is we need each other. And don't you think, though, um, that that's precisely why it would send an extraordinarily powerful message Agreed. if one were yeah. to be able to marshal some of the leaders of the LGBT community on behalf of, of person, persecuted minority communities? And, and I would agree, clearly one needs to bring in the Muslim community, but the term genocide is perhaps not as applicable in that case in, in the sense that you have these terrible... Um, you know, struggles and sectarian, uh, br brutal, bloody battles between um, different uh, elements of the Muslim community. But it is the Yazidis and the Christians who I think are, are more threatened by what we could legitimately term um, genocide. But let me get the others to jump in here. 
Well, you know, I think one of, so we, sort of back to you, to your original question, if I understood it correctly, right, which you're saying, let's look at some of these other, the, these other groups and how they were af able to effectively bring about a grassroots mobilization that, that elicited a call to conscience uh, of either the American community or the global community, and in, in doing so, changed culture or changed policy or changed world history or changed, um, you know, international action in a certain area. And I think without a doubt, all of the communities that you mentioned have been very effective in learning how to mobilize their grassroots, how to um, unify a, a message, and how to bring that message to the conscience of people who aren't necessarily sympathizers with them, but to win over the hearts and minds of, of other individuals. And, and so I would agree with you. Uh, all of those organizations did that very effectively, and there's a, there is a lot that we can learn in that mechanism and in that methodology um, with regard to this issue, and this is an issue which um, we don't have time to waste, right? We don't have time. There's lives hanging in the balance for us to be able to get this message effectively communicated. Yeah. So. Yeah, I would, I would only add that just in terms of coalition building, we should be as big tent as possible. And, and, uh, and, and uh, let's also be clear, I mean, we can learn a lot from the LGBT community's efforts, domestic reform efforts in the United States. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of good lessons to be learned there, number one. Number two, I think the apartheid movement is the, the example of uh, domestic constituency seeking a change in, in foreign policy. Uh, you know, South Africa had uh, you know, uranium, gold, diamonds, a sea lane, and they were anti stridently anti-communist. Yeah. All the ingredients. I mean, this is if, if you're Armenian, this is it's like a Turkey at the south of, uh, of Africa, a very influential country with which with a terrible policy, as it turns out. Uh, but uh, through coalition building and a bottom-up approach from universities to state governments to the Congress to the, the executive branch, throughout the 80s especially, you saw uh, America reach a tipping point where in previous U.S. presidents would go and talk to the leadership in South Africa and say, "Well, we need to do this business, and we'll." set aside these domestic concerns. And at some point, an American president, I think it might have been uh, the first President Bush, uh, had to you know, talk to his South African counterpart and saying, it's just not sustainable. It's not tenable anymore for me to go along with this because my people won't allow it. Right? And that, that, that was a great victory of a, of a domestic movement to change foreign policy. It spoke to issues that we cared about as Americans and our own experience with slavery and injustice in America. So there was a lot of resonance on the issue. But I think that's a, a wonderful example. And that would not have been possible without coalition building. There's a tremendous amount of coalition building. I think it started in the African American community, and they deserve the, uh, the lion's share of the credit. But it was uh, universities and state governments and the Congress and a, a lot of effort. I think that's the model that we would look to for, for how, you can, how you can affect change. Um, and we should be building as many coalitions as possible, always, always. I mean, this, you better have a really good reason to turn anyone down who's willing to help uh, you know, change policy on this issue. I would just say one thing, and that is never underestimate the power of the church. It's been around 2,000 years and uh, has had quite an impact on history. And uh, I think um, in this case, if you look at the history of the downfall of communism, uh, I don't think it was an accident that we had a Polish pope that happened to be in power at the time when that all happened. And so I think we're, we should also really look at ways in which the Christian community, in, I'm not excluding other communities, along with Jewish communities and other communities, but in which the Christian community can unite to say this is evil and we must stop it. And, you know, it's very similar in some ways to communism. I really think that parallel <laughs> must not be forgotten. It's well, worse. It, it, because it's worse because they're, in communism, they were atheists. This time, they're actually claiming they've got God's will on their side. Here, I'm a little, Professor Stanley, I think it's a great point. Here's the sort of the, the big, how I see the big pieces here. Uh, the, the struggle against communism was, was a, a great struggle, an important struggle, a struggle that had uh, you know, overwhelming consensus on this side of the Atlantic, right? And the church, uh, thank God, the Catholic church especially, served our state's interest in changing that system. I think that's wonderful. I would like to see also our states, like the US government and other governments, serve the moral values represented by the church. The, the, we need to be, not simply seek to enlist the church in things that we think are, are important as, as governments, but to try to reflect more of the values that, um, that the church 
represents. And that's really hard. I'll tell you the, the painful experience of being Armenian. I think the Archbishop of Chilean can speak to this much better than I could, which is that uh, at the end of the, the 19th century, right, uh, the there was a very strong uh, solidarity with Christians around the world. There was a huge missionary movement in the United States. And in many ways, there was this belief that 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 uh, faith and, and, and uh, morality should guide America's emergence onto the world stage as a great power. And guess what? We got caught right at the moment where uh, the, the talk was still pretty robust, but America had started the Spanish-American War and, and, or fought the American Spanish-American War and had become a world power. And, and the, the, all the talk kind of receded and the realities of geopolitics uh, uh, came to the fore and Armenians, for all the talk about saving the Armenians, you know, no one saved the Armenians. Uh, and, uh, and Armenia ended up being partitioned and, 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 and largely forgotten for the, you know, most of the next century. So it, it is, it, the, you're, it is a, I'm sorry, you have to turn the tide quite a bit in order to sort of enlist our government or to get our government on the side of what's right. That's, that's what we need to do. It's a hard thing to do, and it's the work of generations, but we need to do that. A, a question I'd like, again, everybody's so knowledgeable here that I, I hate to direct any of these um, questions to a single person on the panel, but I think it's part of the American character that we do tend to sort of root for the underdog. And um, it is easier to mobilize American public opinion and really bring, pres bring pressure to bear when we are perceived as taking up the cause of, um, of that underdog um, character. One of the things I think one of the challenges faced in trying to galvanize the American public about what is happening to Christian communities is this sense that from an American perspective, Christians are never the underdog. They're always the overdog. They're always those that sort of represent power, success, the existing structure. And, um, and I, I think that that's a reality still in the minds of, of many Americans. What thoughts do each of you have about sort of, I don't know if the, the challenge is so much to rewrite that narrative as to explain that that the world has changed, and that narrative is is inapplicable, um, certainly in the Middle East. Uh, and and do you agree that that is part of the problem that we have? That people somewhat shrug their shoulders and say, "Oh my gosh, you know the Christians? They're they're powerful, they're wealthy, they're successful. What what's the problem?" Am I the only one who no, sees totally that? I see nodding good. heads out there, but I don't know if I see any nodding heads here. That's um, a really good point, I think, because, you know, one of the beauties, I think the time I first really realized this was in Detroit, just a few, just a month or two ago, when I went to a conference, you know, of Middle Eastern Christians, uh, Chaldean Christians, Maronite Christians, others. And I, for the first time, I think, in my life, I realized this is where it all started. And you know, bringing the church back into that realization that this is where it all started would be a huge contribution to doing that change that we need in the way we look at this problem here in the United States and in Europe. Uh, we're here trying to rescue our own origins. And, and <laughs> so that that spiritual jujitsu, if you wish, uh, is needed, I think, in this case. We really need to refer back to where we came from. I would, I would agree, and, you know, but I also think that you know, it, there's a danger in trying to focus on the proportion of people who are getting hurt. I think we really need to say, you know, how are we going to stop the murders, the rapes, the kidnapping? you know, the forced relocations. We need to focus on the people who live there, you know, and, and protecting those people. And, and, and when I say there, I mean there in the Middle East, there in Africa, there in Myanmar, you know, and, and we have to be concerned about everybody. And that's how we start, and I completely agree, the tent has to be big. And the only way that we're going to understand each other within that tent is to talk about things we all agree are bad. And, and what's going on here is, is really bad. And it doesn't make any difference who it happens to. You know, it's like this has got to stop. You know, and, and that's why I say that you know, using the G word, the genocide word, yes. You know, but like I say, I don't want to be here 10 years from now debating whether or not there was a genocide. 
you know, if we could figure out a way to open up the records and try people in absentia, then let's go back and open up the records on Turkey. You know, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we're going to find some very, very ugly stuff in our own closet and in the closets of other people, and we have to be prepared for that. That's true. Katrina, I'd like to answer that question, too, in a, in a specific way with an angle on um, the Christian community in the United States or in the United States, Europe, and the Western world. Um, Pope Francis has said in the past he's talked about you know, the, the situation of persecution of Christians in the Middle East and elsewhere and, and named it sort of an, an ecumenism of blood, which um, speaks of uh, a moment of unity among the global Christian community because of a shared sorrow and a shared heartache for um, those who've suffered, uh, particularly in the name of, of their faith. There's, there's a nuance of that that can be taken to a larger universal human community as well. Um, but when you ask the question about the perception and the perception of the underdog, and speaking, looking at this from an angle, particularly from the Christian community of the United States. They, they see everybody, not just Christians, as people in their way and expendable, or exploitable, or kidnappable, or we don't want to say what else, but thanks. Mm. That's true, that's so true. Thank you, Bishop. You know, um, your comments, and thank you so much for them, raise a question that I think is, for me it's unanswerable, because it's so incomprehensible, but I would like to hear the thoughts of, of others on the panel, and also you if you have a thought. What is the whole in the heart or in the soul of our Western societies that is leading to any, let alone significant numbers of young people from relatively fortunate circumstances choosing to evade their parents and go to great lengths to go join a group that, as we know, has not hidden what they're doing, that boldly and um, shamelessly broadcasts the beheadings and the lists of the of the cost for purchasing the the Christian and Yazidi slave women and the the permissibility of of rape and things that seem so just intrinsically evil to us what what is it where is the hole in in our culture that is leading too many young people from Western societies to go to great lengths to join um, such an evil group. Does, you know, I know President Clinton once said that, you know, in, in the realm of persuasion, um, it is sometimes better to be perceived as strong and wrong than right and nuanced. And, you know, he was talking about that much more in the American political context. But, uh, but what are we lacking in terms of strength of conviction and imparting of, you know, clear values about who we are as a society that leads any of these young people, let alone in the hundreds and thousands from Western Europe and increasingly from the United States to try and go and join ISIS or ISIL? Well, I mean, our, our values as Americans are... Uh, People can read about our values, or they can listen to us uh, as we talk about our values, or they can, uh, you know, witness how those policies are reflected in our policies. Uh, those values are reflected in policy around the world. And all too often, uh, in relations with so many countries, they're driven by interests, and, and they're very um, uh, naked interests. They have to do with uh, our military bases and our access to energy and uh, the geopolitics of you know who wins and who loses. And so the message we send to the world is that you know we we're. You know, it's interest-driven policy. It's not a, a moral-driven policy. And that's understandable. If, if you're a diplomat or a soldier, these are the types of things that you need to think about. Uh, but it's short-sighted because those types of policies uh, come back and bite you. They come back and bite you. It's a false choice to think that we can uh, compromise our morality as a nation to advance our interests as a country. It's a false choice. But we make that choice over and over and over again. I, I, was, I had the the ill fortune of being at the White House uh, right before April 24th of this year, uh, met with the, the Chief of Staff and some others, uh, where they explained the, the stuff of geopolitics and why this is not the year that America is going to do the right thing on the Armenian genocide. 
And there's always an explanation. There's always some guy with a PhD or a military rank who's going to explain the position paper about why we have to compromise one more time, as if in the long run it's going to serve our national interest. Uh, we can we could work for an exception of uh, in terms of U.S. general approach to the world on the issue of ISIS and, and Christians and others in the Middle East. Or and we can do that. We should do that, right? But or we can all all simultaneously in parallel aspire toward uh, U.S. foreign policy that is driven by our values that actually reflects and is aligned with the things that we believe in as Americans. Everyone deserves, you know, freedom. Everyone deserves uh, security. No one deserves to be marched into the desert. No one deserves to be murdered or raped or assaulted simply because of who they are or what they believe. These are like simple common sense things. Like I said, if you poll the American people on these things, you'll get like in the high 90s. Why is it not reflected in our policy as a nation? I think that if we can, if we can present that face to the world, right, I think that God willing, uh, the response of the world to, to, to us would be uh, a more tolerant and sane one. Well, I'm going to be a little, you know, more skeptical here. Please. And I'm going to say that it's our own fault. You know, that we officially in the United States, we have taken the position both in foreign policy that religion is a problem, so we don't look at what goes on. Our government has allowed uh, a lot of the prisons in the United States to be staffed by people who were trained in Saudi Arabia, which is where the Wahhabi way of looking at things comes from. You know, and in our public schools, in the entire Ninth Circuit, which covers the Western states, it is unconstitutional for children to read the Bible, the Koran, the Book of Mormon, in the original. And so, so basically, the kids can't learn. We have a constitutional right under the First Amendment in the Ninth Circuit to be ignorant about the people that we're actually trying to deal with. So, <clears throat> so there used to be a, a great old, old, uh, you know, comic strip called Pogo, and Pogo used to say, "We have met the enemy, and he is us." And I think that you know we have ourselves to blame, and we have to start looking very seriously. And I come back to this question that, that uh, uh, Bishop Mansour was talking about. It's we have to understand our, mother, our Muslim brothers and sisters and understand that they're fighting this too, and we will learn far better how to fight it and how to deal with those kids because th this is their kids who are going, and those kids feel profoundly alienated, but I have no idea how you reach them. Can I, can I offer a last thought on that, yes. Katrina? And I know we probably want to move on to Q&A, yes. right? So, um, but I, I guess I would just say as well, I think that if you're talking particularly about young people, it's not unique just to recruits to ISIS or recruits to terrorism. I think across the globe, We've seen that there's this moving trend that young people, particularly in the Western world, tend to be more spiritual, tend to be, tend to be looking for uh, religious communities, maybe even more so than their, their parents' generation. What, um, Oliver Roy, a, a scholar of, of Islam studies, always talks about this concept of the global ummah and the, 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 um, the attraction of young people to this sort of um, <coughs> to, to global religious communities, and that takes place in the in the Christian communities as well, in the Jewish communities. Um, I think that in many ways, the the modern secular world that we live in, as as Professor Destro was saying, um, oftentimes doesn't offer youth who are by their nature idealistic, who are have deep spiritual resonance, who are looking for a place to belong and who are looking for a cause and a mission to give their life to, mm -hmm. that sometimes our modern secular world, they, f they, find, in it, 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 they find it unsatisfying. And so um, they look to identify and to, um, to identify them, it, themselves and to align their lives with, with larger, greater causes. I think they do that in many areas of society and unfortunately, that same appeal of youth that's looking for the cause, it also among some, um, has, you know, ISIS and extremism and religious extremism has been able to monopolize on that appeal, um, that monopolize on that natural even um, desire of youth to give to a great cause. And they've done it well through social media. They've done it well in many ways. I, I, this is going to sound like, you know, uh, sort of like a little overly patriotic or maybe uh, idealistic, but 
an America that lives up to uh, an America that lives up to our ideals will outcompete anybody. Outcompete anybody. What we have to offer the world is, um, in my humble opinion, far more attractive than hate and intolerance that is being peddled by others. Uh, all we need to do is just live up to our values. When people see hypocrisy, you know, especially young people, they're have very good radar for hypocrisy, right? Uh, they write it off and they say, you know, just more of the same. But to the extent that we live up to our values, I think we'll outcompete all but the sort of the, mm -hmm. the darkest, uh, mm -hmm. um, most intolerant aspects of uh, the world community. Well, we'd like to, to now open this up to questions from the audience. So um, let's begin with this gentleman here. Okay, can I share some positive news? Please. Okay. <laughs> uh, I will, I will. Uh, <laughs> once they ask General Norm Schwarzkopf, who are you to judge people? Who are you to invade countries? Uh, uh, God is the judge. He said, uh, we are not judging. We are only preparing the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I come uh, from a country where uh, our uh, army, even with minimal capabilities, are preparing these daily and weekly meetings. I come from Beirut, Lebanon, and the Lebanese army are dealing with, uh, already dealt, I think we have other issues now, uh, in the rural areas of Lebanon with the ISIS uh, terrorists. So these are my positive news. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. My, my name is uh, Thomas Abraham. I'm from the Anthony R. Abraham Foundation in Miami, Florida. Uh, my father uh, was one of a very uh, ten of very poor family and, and, and was raised in the United States and became very successful. I'm one of two adopted children from Beirut, Lebanon. Our family supported the Maronite Church substantially in the United States. We're very involved in Lebanon. And what I'm hearing here today is very simple from my perspective, is that we live in the greatest country in the world. But like every successful team, if it's a football team, a baseball team, a basketball team in the United States, we know one thing. To be successful, you have leadership. Now, you know, we've talked about all these issues in this country. And every time we have a great leader, we don't have the same issues. But we have different type of issues. But at least we have faith and we have hope that they're going to be resolved. Now, we have the Pope coming to the United States, and everybody in this room is hoping that he will say something in front of Congress and to the world that will make everybody stand up and understand what roles we all have to play individually and collectively. So the issue is not about what needs to be done. I think this panel here has already said what needs to be done, and I, I agree with each one of the recommendations that you've made. It's true. Genocide is happening in the Middle East. And your comments about, you know, uh, taking it to a, a political point of view and, and uh, from a legal point of view is correct. That should be done. But we need leaders in this country to stand up and say this is what they're going to do. And one of those candidates hopefully will say that if we get to their attention that this needs to be done. So my comment here today, it's about leadership. It's not only leadership from our churches, it's but by every priest, every bishop that stands up in the pulpit and speaks about this issue needs to be speaking about it more clearly and more directly to our communities today and every Sunday until it gets into the minds and hearts of each one of us that this is not a passing thing. This is something that's happening. We're talking to people every day and they're saying, oh, I was just in a meeting a couple of minutes ago. It's a 30-year war. It's a 10-year war. Are the Christians going to wait for 30 years while they're getting slaughtered? No. So I'm hoping that when the Pope comes here, that the Pope will send a message, not only to the United States, but to the whole world, what we all need to do. And that's my 10 cents worth. Thank you. Um, uh, I should like to thank IDC for this uh, great event and for inviting me to this uh, convention. Um, my name is Aziz Emanuel Zebari. I am a university professor and I'm also a member of the Chaldean Syriac Syrian Popular Council, and also the officer in charge of Iraq Church Project Development. Uh, the dim and dark picture which I carry from home is that every Christian individual is now planning to leave the country. Their minds and hearts are set on leaving the country. What we are doing now is, sorry for the analogy, is like a situation whereby there is a dying man, and doctors are just thinking of inviting medical tools to, to save them. Uh, what we need now is 
uh, that we need immediate uh, actions for uh, the imposition of a safe haven for the Christian community, because no matter how hard and destructive the present situation in Iraq is, there will, there will always be Kurds and Arabs, Sunnis, Muslims, Turkmen, but there will be no Christians and no Yazidis. Since my childhood, I have been displaced for 11 times. And I hope this panel and this convention will do something to something tangible, something concrete, which will restore hope in the hearts and minds of the Christian community in Iraq, uh, either to stay or to leave. I don't think they will wait for all these uh, ideas and uh, uh, I mean uh, 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 suggestions uh, to materialize. I think by the time they materialize, it will be too late. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you. شكرا جزيلا القاضي رائد اسحاق عضو مجلس النواب العراقي عن المكون المسيحي احد ممثلي المكون المسيحي في المجلس هناك تقرير لبعثه خاصه تابعه لمجلس حقوق الانسان في الامم المتحده قبل عده اشهر أشار هذا التقرير إلى أن ما قامت به داعش يرقى إلى جريمة الإبادة الجماعية وجرائم ضد الإنسانية وجرائم حرب هذا فيما يتعلق من الأخوة الأيزيدية إلا أن التقرير المذكور أشار إلى أن بخصوص المسيحيين والشبك أشار هذا التقرير إلى مجرد التهجير وإنما تعرض له لا يعتبر جريمة إبادة جماعية القصة هي اجتياح المنطقة الموصل وسهل نينوى شبح أسود لا يعرف غير لغة السيف والقتل والتهجير لكل من يخالف أفكاره ومفاهيمه ومعتقداته البداية كانت في مدينة الموصل وبعد شهر من الزمان لدخول داعش إلى الموصل وتحديدا في 17-7-2004 أفاق الموصوليون على مكبرات الصوت والمآذن تدعو المسيحيين إلى ترك المدينة قصرا وفي فترة أقصاها 24 ساعة وإلا فمصيرهم واحد من ثلاث الإسلام أو دفع الجزية أو حد السيف They will face three things: convert to Islam or pay jizya, the tax, or you will be murdered or executed. مما أضطرهم مكرهين إلى مغادرة الموصل. So they were forced to flee Mosul. إلى أين؟ إلى سهل نينوى حيث الكثافة السكانية المسيحية في تلك البلدات. So from Mosul they fled to the Ninve Plain where the majority of Christians live. إن الأن الأوضاع في سهل نينوى لم تكن أحسن ما كانت عليه في الموصل بسبب قيام أتباع داعش بقطع الماء والكهرباء عن المنطقة وحرارة الصيف الملتهبة May we ask the gentleman what he feels not only a group like this but our government should be doing in response الفكرة السؤال هل ما تعرضه المسيحيين لا يعتبر جريمة إبادة جماعية ماذا ممكن أن يقوم به هذا المؤتمر لدفع 
الأمم المتحدة إلى الاعتراف بأن ما تعرض له المسيحيين يشكل جريمة إبادة جماعية ونحن اليوم في عاصمة أعظم دولة وأقوى دولة في العالم واشنطن وإنما قامت به الولايات المتحدة وبقية الدول المتحالفة معها والمنظمات الدولية لم يزل معاناة المهجرين قسرا وبعد مضي وبعد مضي أكثر من سنة على سيطرة داعش على الموصل وسهل نينوى وما هناك في الأفق ما يشير إلى أن تلك المواضق سوف تتحرر I want to thank you for bringing your no. your personal testimony of what's happened. I do want to give others a chance to to um, to participate. Thank Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I apologize because I haven't been able to see this side. I'd like to call on the gentleman there. Or, or, I'm sorry, or is there? I, yes, yes, okay. Uh, yes, I'm Russell King, retired federal employee. I'll, I'll direct this question uh, initially to uh, Professor Destro. Uh, I've heard from a source I believe is reliable that when, when we bombed Daesh or ISIL, um, uh, a significant number of Sunni Muslims think that we're aligned with Iran, especially if, if an Iranian uh, control group takes over. And um, uh, I, I also have a question about Sharia law. Okay, now Iran has, is a Muslim state, so it has its Sharia law. Uh, ISIL has its Sharia law, and what you call genocide, they call justice. I'm wondering what the optimum Sharia or the, or the optimum governance of, of, of a Muslim majority as it applies to Christians, what should take over after ISIL leaves? Because I presume uh, in, if ISIL is defeated in, in Iraq, the Iraqi government would go, uh, take over. And if they're defeated in Syria, the Syrian government would take over. There are problems with those governments. But how, how, how do you see the legal succession? Well, that's a tall order. The, the, let me answer the first question. Uh, the first question is about Sharia law. Sharia law doesn't cover, Sharia law prohibits murder. It prohibits rape. It prohibits kidnapping. You know, and Sharia law, as, as most people understand it, doesn't really cover, you know, most of the rest of society, but it does cover these things. So whatever they say they're doing is not Sharia law. So that's one. Uh, two, you know, no, no, that... No, that then the question is, is the killing justified? That's you know, we can't get into that big legalistic discussion right now. But you know, but the but the Prophet Mohammed himself Right. No, the Prophet Mohammed the Prophet Mohammed himself in the covenant to Saint Catherine's said that you must protect the Christians. Okay, he said that. And he said if you that you will go to hell if you don't. Right. I mean, I understand that, but that you can see the difficulty of all of this. And, and believe me, we are picking up the, the pieces right now after World War I. Okay, so the World Post World War I order is collapsing, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to pick it up and clean it up. And so this whole question of who's aligned with whom, a lot of people in the Middle East think that the United States started ISIS. You know, so let's just be serious about, you know, what we need to get people in the tent and get them to talk about what they really think. And believe me, we're not going to like it any more than the, my, my friends over here didn't like what I had to say. You know, so. I, I think that um, I, I think that just the little back and forth we've had here illustrate um, the importance in a way of what, what you were saying, Aram, that um, certainly within many faith traditions, one can find contradictory injunctions, and one can find things um, that, that may be troubling, and one can find groups that will seize upon um, terrible, uh, you know, directives um, from one source or another. But 
one of the things I, I think that, that we see is that, um, that societies, and this is where you know, I feel so passionately about the mission of USERF, that societies that embed into the warp and woof of their political and cultural identity, this value of religious freedom, freedom of religion, mm -hmm. conscience and belief, by their very terms, they push yes. out of the realm of permissible conduct, those who would seek to um, act upon or elevate the despicable portions of their religious traditions. I mean, we do know that there there's a legitimate dispute within Islam as to whether some horrible things are countenanced. Yeah. But when the broader society says, this is not permitted, we insist that in our shared community, people have the, the freedom of religion, conscience, and belief that demands mutual respect and demands the mutual accommodation that a modern society hinges upon, then we are able to largely delegitimize and defang and, and, um, and disarm whatever are the extremist elements of any faith community. And that has not happened in the societies in the Middle East. And, and that's really the critical thing, which is why religious freedom is, I believe, religious freedom broadly construed. The, the freedom of everybody to live their lives according to the dictates of their own conscience and without fear of retribution, without fear of threat, without fear of social ostracization to have their place within the community. That is, in the long run, a very powerful antidote to the extremism, the distortion, the perversion of any faith community. If I could just add to that, yes. just to echo that. Uh, as an organizing principle, uh, with an iron will, avoid things that are divisive and that will create uh, sort of petty divisions which will uh, uh, serve to um, um, detract from the unity of this organization and this movement, right? There's no end of things that will divide. And this city is like, as a specialty, there's like the, the special of the day, every single day in Washington is eating groups that uh, don't know how to, mm -hmm. to stick together and get divided over like small petty issues, over this issue, that issue. St find, find the core base issues. I think IDC has done that, right? People should have uh, the freedom of faith. Treat other people how you might like to be treated, right? You can all agree on that, right? Beyond that, whatever, everyone's got an idea, great. But bring to the table a devotion to that, those simple ideas and organize around those ideas. Otherwise, this city will very quickly devour you. Very, very quickly devour you. The, the, the number of uh, idealistic movements that have crashed upon uh, the rocks of the Potomac are, are myriad, right? And we don't want to be one of them. We don't want to be one of them. Uh, but I would just like to say one word, if I may. I'm. I'm uh, taking advantage of having this moderator's mic here, but I think some of the concerns expressed over in, in this part of the room, if I may, are legitimate in that we must not, in the interest of advancing and building a broad coalition, we must not be so um, fearful of also speaking the truth about some very, very terrifying and uncomfortable realities. I know some months ago, it might be maybe six months ago, there was a really powerful article, I believe it was in The Atlantic by um, an author, Gra I think it was Graham Wood, I don't know if that rings a bell with anybody, but the title of it was What ISIS Wants. And, um, and he made a very compelling case that many of the horrible things that ISIS preaches have some basis within um, a historic understanding of Islam, and that we are, you know, we are not doing ourselves a favor if we pretend that that's not true. That doesn't mean that it represents even remotely the vast majority of decent Muslims in the world today, but we cannot blind ourselves and we cannot naively close our eyes to another reality, which is that they have some um, they have an argument, they have a theological argument that has some basis in some doctrines and in some writings of their faith. And in order to fully understand and wrestle with the magnitude of the problem, we have to be ready to acknowledge that. Adlai Stevenson once said, solutions begin by telling the truth. And some of the truths that we have to confront as we face the threat and the danger of ISIS are very uncomfortable. And they are very politically incorrect, and they're very difficult. But if we shy away from them, we do a huge disservice, not only to the cause of the persecuted minority communities in whose defense we're gathered here today, but to the persecuted 
untold majority of Muslims who are, as has been said by Professor Destro, the primary victims of this dangerous and evil movement. Yeah, and in, in that sense, the victory of, of this movement would only not only save the victims, but in, in the moral sense, also save the perpetrators as well to redeem them from this the path that they've chosen. And that's and they are they are, yes. we are as the Bible teaches all worthy of mercy. No question. My name is Nahran Anwia. I'm an Assyrian American, and I thank you all for being here. We truly, truly need hundreds of these to make any changes, and I also thank IDC. As an Assyrian American, I am actually a descendant from my great-grandmother, who was the only survivor from our family of the Assyrian genocide, which is rarely ever mentioned, which includes our Chaldean and Syriac brothers and sisters. 750,000 Assyrians were massacred 100 years ago, rarely ever mentioned. Until today, unlike the Armenian genocide, our genocide, which all of these government officials from Iraq are here, still continues. And we are always, always persecuted. Even our language is highly persecuted. They won't even allow us to wear our crosses. I mean, the atrocities that you hear on the media, which I have addressed nationally, internationally, locally, in every possible way you can think of, rarely ever gets mentioned. And what bothers me the most is many government officials and policymakers ask us, what can we do to help you? We are never empowered. Please start empowering the Christians in Iraq and Syria. And the way you can do that is we need arms to go directly to us. We need an internationally protected safe haven. Okay, the, our neighbors are constantly getting armed, but we're always forgotten. And I'm sorry to say this, if any of them are present here, we are not protected in Iraq, even by the governments at all. Because if we were, we have gone from 30 million to barely, like uh, Congressman Wolf said, not e we're not even making 400,000 of the population. Our population proves that we are persecuted by everyone in that country. If we're not persecuted, and I'm sorry, I cannot be politically, politically correct because I am speaking on behalf of my nation that is being annihilated and I can barely hold my posture here. We are being massacred and I don't know how much longer we can go. Over a hundred churches have been blown up. Young girls, four years old, are getting raped by ISIS, and nobody's defending us, not one person. Four-year-old girls are being raped by men. We need to be empowered. You need to start working directly with these cradlers of civilization who still speak Aramaic. Please. Yes, they need to take a decision. They need to implement these strategies they're working on. We have been pleading since last June. I was protesting right in front of the White House to the administration to please act now. When my aunt called us from Iraq, we didn't even know what ISIS was. It was nowhere on the media. And she said, Nahren, these people have invaded our homes. They're taking everything from us, all of our wealth. Our young girls are being taken in these trucks and being loaded like they were cattle. She said, please, make a change. I went with our churches, with a group of us, about 400 of us, and we prote protested in front of the White House. Until now, we have seen no concrete solution. And I am begging, and begging I will continue to do that as an activist for my nation to please act now and actually start implementing a solution to work directly with the Christians, no middlemen, no middlemen. That is the best advice I can give because there's so much corruption that these weapons, this aid is not going to us. Our numbers prove it. We're getting displaced everywhere as the indigenous people, native people. What would happen if somebody came and started slaughtering all the Native Americans in the United States? We are the natives of Iraq and Syria and we can't even speak our language and we cannot even pray in our churches because as we're praying, we're being detonated. And speaking for someone like Maryam, who was interviewed on national TV, who was taken from her mother's arms by ISIS, she's still in their ownership. Please, everyone that's listening, the media, all the policymakers here, please, on behalf of these people that are highly persecuted and persecuted the most, more than Islam, because Islam is not facing a genocide. They're not facing an annihilation. Who's facing an extinction are the Christians and the Yazidis. Thank you. Thank you. That's the kind of passion we need in, in, in this city. 
number one. Number two, uh, we've worked very closely with our uh, Syrian, Chaldean, and Syriac brothers and sisters, and anytime we offer legislation dealing with the Armenian genocide, guarantee the Assyrian genocide, SAFO is, is mentioned right alongside with it. There's, we, we carry glad to, to shoulder that burden and, and to work on that issue, number one. Number two, in terms of seeking salvation from others, right, it's obviously very tempting for us. We are here in America and we seek America's intervention to, to help us. I will give you a, a lesson learned the hard way, right? The Armenians were subject to genocide during the First World War. They were promised by the French and the victorious European powers, by the Americans, President Wilson, by the, the Russians who uh, were acted as protectors of uh, the Armenians in the region. Salvation from the outside, from, from outside, right? All of them promised something to the Armenians, some security, some future, some restoration, right? And one by one, they all walked away from it. The U.S. Senate wouldn't support Wilson's plans. The Russians had their revolution. The French cut their, uh, made their separate peace with the Turks. And one by one, everyone, everyone, um, every promise that was made to the Armenians to provide security and a future dissolved, right? And Armenians were uh, left to themselves and eventually partitioned. And, and uh, so I offer this, and not, I'm not happy to say these things, but I say this, that uh, seeking the salvation of third parties is like, you should always try. You should always seek sympathy. If there's relief aid to be offered, if there's political support, if there are weapons, you know, you can't turn away uh, the help of others. But final analysis, you have to rely upon yourself. And that has to be the plan A. The plan A has got to be how can we uh, defend and support ourselves, then seek the support of others. Because uh, it's very often a um, you know, house of cards. The, all the promises you get are, don't always translate into reality. That's a lesson learned the hard way by the Armenians. I, I'm afraid we're going to need to bring this session to an end. Kirsten has a message, uh, an announcement, I guess. I just have a, a brief announcement, and I want to, first of all, thank everyone. I know we've gone a little bit over time. Um, I want to thank, of course, um, all of our exceptional uh, speakers and panelists, uh, Dr. Lantra Sweat, Dr. Stanton, uh, F Professor Destro, and uh, Armin. So thank you so much for being here. We actually have um, on his way uh, Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, who is the co-chair to the Congressional Caucus for Religious Minorities in the Middle East. He's l literally a few minutes away. And he actually asked if he could co to come by, he wanted to stop by um, to make an announcement. He's gonna speak about the genocide resolution which is being introduced to the House, United States Congress House of Representatives within the hour um, today. And he wanted to come and address this community here and make the announcement of the resolution. Um, that being said, I know that we have, have gone over time. We do have um, some water and coffee in the back, but we, I, I think really the congressman will be here in, within a few minutes. So if there's still people with more questions, if people have uh, the ability to stay and want to hear the announcement from Congressman Fortenberry, I just suggest we, we wait for the, wait for the congressman, and he'll and he'll be here. That being said, I understand we've gone over time. If people if people have other obligations, please feel free to, uh, to move on. Uh, is that okay with you? Unfortunately, going to have to depart myself um, because I have a plane that I have to catch. But I think that um, the very impassioned words of this lovely um, young woman who just spoke and really the testimonies we've heard from many people leave me with one clear conviction, which is that I need to do more. You need to do more. Each one of us needs to do more. You know, we're facing a foe in ISIL that doesn't hesitate to ask its followers to do anything and everything they ask. And we are, in our comfortable lives, afflicted by that very comfort and ease. You know, we want to put a, a nice little boundary about how much we're going to do and how involved we're going to get and how committed we're going to be. And each of us needs to do more. Yes, Professor. I just wanted to um, invite you to pick up a copy of the statement from the International Association of Genocide Scholars. There's a hundred copies out there on the table out there. Uh, we hope that they will be introduced in Congress at the same time that this resolution is introduced. So uh, please feel free to pick it up. Okay. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lantos, Dr. Lantos Sweat, for your um, service moderating this panel today. It was really an honor to have you, and you did a fantastic job, so we're very grateful. Thank you to all of our uh, illustrious panelists.
we we learned a great deal, and and we are we're grateful for your availability. I would like to introduce um, Congressman Jeff Fortenberry from the great state of Nebraska, who, as I mentioned, is also one of the co-chairs for the Congressional Caucus of for Religious Minorities in the Middle East, and he's. Um, joining us from the Hill to make uh, a, a brief announcement and closing of the panel. So, Congressman, I'll leave the mic to you. And thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. I know you've had an intense uh, day of discussions about a very lamentable topic, um, which is quite painful for many of us, but particularly painful for those of you who have a strong attachment by ethnicity or family a religious faith to um, persons in the Middle East. As I was riding over here, I was reflecting on something that happened to me when I was a younger person. Um, I had an opportunity in 1979 to take a semester out of college and travel to the country of Egypt. And as I entered the Sinai Desert, there was a all too familiar pile of concrete and rubble uh, that is now all over the Middle East. But on that particular pile, it was written, the words were written both in Arabic and in English. Here was the war, here is the peace. Now, that fragile peace has held for a very, very long time. Cold, difficult sometimes, but is held. And later in that same experience, I remember going, being brought to, a, a, to stay with a Muslim family in, a, in an oasis area, a large oasis called the Fayum. They were farmers, and they were very, very eager to introduce me to their neighbors. And although English was a problem, the, my host brought me to his neighbor, held out his hand, and it showed the Christian cross. And he took the Christian neighbor's hand and put it to his head, a gesture of respect and brotherhood in the Middle East. What has happened? Christianity, particularly in Syria and Iraq, now is shattered. The fragile coexistence between Christians and Muslims and other religious faiths in that area is gone. And there is a scandal of silence, as Pope Francis has said, from the international community. We cannot simply watch this happen and hope it goes away and then attend to the consequences, such as the large problem of migration that is now occurring. Christians and other peoples have every much a right to their ancient homeland as anyone else. So today in Congress, we have introduced a resolution that calls this what it is. It's a genocide. And the initial response that we are getting, I think it's a hopeful indication of what will happen in Congress, that this will gain momentum, that international consciousness will be raised, that the difficult problem of how to deal with the unjust structures that have led to this genocide will be addressed quickly. And in the meanwhile, Christianity particularly, which is broken, beaten, and dying, may have the hope still of hanging on to that ancient faith tradition and that ancient homeland. So thank you all very much for your interest in this. Thank you for giving us the power to do this, because it's organizations like In Defense of Christians and others, and those of you who continue to bring us your story. I have a, a friend, I visited, called upon him at one point. He is the Archbishop Cardinal of Vienna, and he showed me the chancery and told me a story. And when Hitler annexed Austria in the late 1930s, uh, apparently, the archbishop at that time went in the St. Stephen's Cathedral and gave this very, very fiery speech to the youth of the city. And he said, Jesus is your Fuhrer. Well, this provoked the Nazis. And they sent in the Hitler youth, and they stormed the chancery, threw one of the priests out of the window. The archbishop was able to escape by hiding in the, in the rafters. But one of the children took a knife to the painting of Christ and began to stab it. And he couldn't reach all the way to Christ's body, so the legs were all shattered and torn. And after the war was done and after the pieces were being picked up and everything being repaired, 
the archbishop looked at the painting and said, no, leave it the way it is. Let us be reminded of how this evil can manifest itself. The fallen nature of persons, of man, can manifest itself in any time, in any age. And we must stand for righteousness. God bless you all. Thank you.